Welcome to Western Civ History 134, World War I Part 2, 1915, stalemate on the Western Front. Well, let's check in on how the fronts look in 1915. Here is the map of Europe in 1914, just before the war breaks out. And then here we are at the end of 1914 and the beginning of 1915. So you can see that the Germans have withdrawn the higher ground after being stopped at the Battle of the Marne, and the Russians have lost some territory in their region as well. So that's the situation. The map that you see here is the map showing the strategy of 1915. The red line is the beginning of the front lines of the German trenches. And then you see the train line from Lille to Metz that the Germans are going to use to supply their trench lines. And they're building in depth back through there. The Allies realize that once those trenches are finalized, it's going to be very difficult to attack them. So in 1915, they mount these very large campaigns. And as you can see, they're very successful or appear to be very successful. The French 10th Army breaks through and gets all the way to Douai and the Champagne 4th Army actually gets partially through the railroad line. The British are stopped outside of Leo, but unfortunately they will run out of steam. They'll be forced to retreat. But what happens is the French and the British come to the conclusion that if you put enough men in these positions that they can break through. What they don't realize is the troops that they're using are elite forces. These are the well-trained troops that were already in their armies, and many of them were units that had a long history, and they would not give up making their target, and they will eventually use them up, unfortunately. Now, you'll notice that the Germans really only have one offensive move on, along this front, and that's their attacking Ypres. Now, that name is usually pronounced all sorts of different ways. My pronunciation is what I was told from one of my listeners on history according to Bob who lives there. Yeeprez. It's been pronounced as Yeeps. It's been pronounced as Yarp. But one of the things that's going to happen there at the second battle of Yeeprez, the poison gas will be used for the first time by the Germans. The major events of 1915, the Battle for Gallipoli, which will last from February the 19th to January the 10th, the Battle of Ypres, the Second Battle of Ypres, April the 22nd to May the 25th, the sinking of the Lusitania on May the 7th, and then the Italians join the Allies, May the 23rd. As I mentioned before, during most of 1915, the French with British troops assault the German lines with their best troops during the, what's known as the Nouvelle Chapelle campaign. The Battle of Gallipoli. Here is where Gallipoli is located, down here in the corner of this map. It looks like a simple task. It's the Ottoman Empire. Their army is relatively weak, supposedly. The British Navy is strong. They figure they can just blow through there, and they'll be able to aid the Russians. It's a little closer view of that same area. The Dardanelles Straits, the Sea of Mamara, and the Bosporus. Here we see where Gallipoli is located. Most of the fighting is going to be on the tip of that peninsula, and on the back side where the beaches are. It's a little more of a topographical map. The British are going to be landing on the beaches and then have to fight their way up into the hillside. The Navy's responsibility is then to fight their way through the opening, the Dardanelles Straits, and then head up through the narrow location at Kankakiel which is the narrowest spot. Here we see the invasion locations where the British troops are coming in. And I would say there's French troops there, but the, the big contingent is the Anzacs, the Australian New Zealanders. This battle of Gallipoli is the defining moment in the Australian New Zealand military. To this day, it is their Memorial Day. Gallipoli Day is a national holiday in both countries, and the people take it very seriously. Sure Jerry and I were in Istanbul in Turkey the year before the 100th anniversary of this battle, and the place was swarming with Brits, but particularly Australian and New Zealanders. And they were usually relatives of soldiers who had been here, and this was this was a pilgrimage for them. But you'll see on, on this map the darkened area where the, most of the naval fighting took place. And of course, you don't have to have a big navy if you've got a narrow spot. So the biggest problem that the British 
had was the Turks mined that whole area. Several ships were, were sunk. They just couldn't get through them, which meant that you couldn't land forces on the opposite side of the peninsula and force the Turks to withdraw. The Turks sat there on the top and shoved down on their opponents and their the Anzacs and the Brits and what few French were there kept having to march uphill, get in the trenches that they built on the hillside and then try to advance even further uphill while the Turks are just shooting down at them. It is just a slaughter. Looking at the map, it appears that that narrow place by Kankakil is pretty narrow, but this is what it actually looks like. Sherry and I were going to Troy and in order to cross from one side to the other, we had to cross here. So we took a ferry. So here's one of the Ottoman fortifications on one side where we first arrived. And here we are about halfway across this particular little area. And then we turn and look at Kankakil on the other side. And then as we come into the harbor, you see the other fort. You have to understand too that the Turks had artillery lining this entire area and were firing at the British ships. They were just like sitting ducks. We'd also mention that this is a very important location. In the ancient world, this is the narrowest spot in the Dardanelle Straits. So this is where Xerxes put his pontoon bridge and marched across his army for the Second Persian War. This is the area where Alexander embarked his troops by ship to take them to the other side to begin his conquests of Persia. So this has been back and forth by invaders throughout history. The Battle of Gallipoli, August the 25th, 1915 to January the 10th, 1916. And don't get the idea that there's fighting every day. You, know, you have to come ashore, you have to get your trenches, you're fighting back and forth, you're going to have the allies attacking, you're going to have counterattacking. It becomes quite complicated. Here's an early picture from the battle site, and you see the troops landing, building their base down in the, uh, in the harbor. And this is an aerial view today of the site. And you see they have a wonderful driving area where you can park and view the different locations. I believe this is called the, the Anzac Cove. And then you have the big mountainous region there where the Turks were emplaced. And of course the Allies and, will then come up and build their trenches. And here's two aerial photographs from the time of the battle showing the trench lines and how complicated. Here's a distance shot showing the trench lines. And remember, you have the base camp down by the, the sea and then the Allies will have trench up above and the Turks will be up above them and so the slugfest is going on up in the upper region with the trenches but of course the Turks are also shelling down below there's a closer shot of the of the trench lines from this the same area and then you see today this is the Anzac Memorial and this is the actually on the top plateau part where there was fighting as well and it's a memorial to the soldiers of the Australian New Zealand groups as well as the British and Turks as a cemetery up there as well. Now, this was a campaign that was put forth by Winston Churchill. And Winston Churchill had a great World War II. He had a terrible World War I. As you see his quote, the price to be paid for taking Gallipoli would no doubt be heavy. Unfortunately, they didn't take it. And it'll end up costing him his job. Churchill is first Lord of the Admiralty. So basically, he's in charge of the Navy. And a couple of things he did during the war was he thought it would be okay to go ahead and bring munitions over on passenger ships that wouldn't the Germans wouldn't sink a passenger ship. They also came up with the idea of putting uh, guns below decks on merchant ships so that when a submarine came up to warn them that they were going to be sunk, they could pop the gun up, shoot at the submarine. So the submarines didn't want to take any chances. They just sank everything. Now, while Churchill was not successful at Gallipoli, the man on the other side of the picture was. That is Mustafa Kemal. You might know him as Kemal Ataturk, the Great Turk. He is the Turkish commander. He will eventually become the first president of Turkey, and he will lead Turkey into the modern world and create constitution, but he is in charge at Gallipoli, and the Turks are excellent fighters when well-led and well-equipped. You don't want to mess with them, and they held out, and they fought and drove the Allies out, and look at the casualties. This is the casualty list, which is the latest one that I have. It still is kind of odd, because it shows the Turks having 250 
50,000 killed, wounded, and missing. But they're they're on high ground. Now, they do counterattack, and that's going to run up their casualties. And then you have British, French, and Anzac casualties, and they run exactly the same. One would assume that if you're, you're getting shelled from above all the time and you have to keep fighting going uphill, that you're going to have higher casualties. And we do know that the casualty numbers are are completely bogus for the most part. Usually the, the Allies had a tendency to overestimate the enemies and underestimate theirs. But still, even if you use those numbers as being absolutely correct, here we have in less than a year, in one part of the battlefield, one part of the area of World War One in Europe, 250,000 people gone. That's, that's huge. So Gallipoli is a disaster for the Allies. And as I said before, Churchill will be removed from his position. The Second Battle of Ypres, from the 22nd to May the 25th, 1915. This is the first use of poison gas by the Germans. The location of Ypres is right here on our map. Before I talk about the poison gas use at Ypres, let's look at the battle itself. I think one of the things that most people are unaware of is just how incredible the artillery barrage is. Now here is our map of the second battle, and it shows the Germans are advancing and pushing the French back towards the city. Now here is a picture of Ypres that it says today, but it, it's actually from before the battle took place, before any of the battles took place. And then here's a look at the same city shortly after the first battle of Ypres. And then here is an aerial view of the battlefield across the river from the city. That's overlapping shell hole over overlapping shell hole. That's the way all of these battles are. And that would be, if you had trenches on either side, that would be what no man's land would look like. If you happen to be at the Battle of Ypres from the ground, this is what it looks like. You're trying to maneuver through all of that. And then in the end, when the second battle was over, this is what the city looked like. You can tell where the main building was, a little bit of the church, but the rest of it is gone, is leveled. And then here's the casualties from the second battle. French and the British lost 60,000 troops. The Germans lost 35,000 troops. And that's going to be mostly from the result of artillery and regular fire, but you will have gas casualties as well. And it's particularly troublesome at this battle because the British and the French do not have gas masks at this time. Let's look at the types of poison gas. Now, this is a picture that shows how poison gas is normally used. You would fire it and then have this cloud then go over the enemy position. Hopefully, you've got your infantry in masks following along behind so that once this dissipates over the trench lines, this should give them an opportunity to attack the soldiers before they're, they've got their defenses prepared. Of course, the problem with this, the wind can change and blow the other directions. So you need to make sure you have gas masks for this. And it's very similar to what they try to do with artillery, which is called rolling artillery. You would fire artillery as your troops are going across no man's land. The object was to keep it ahead of your troops so you're not actually killing your own people. So that by the time the barrage is over, you're there at the edge of the trench line. That's something that both sides try to do, and it's not really very effective for quite some time. Now here's some of the types. Now if you're in my Western Civ class, please do not try to write this down. If you go to the website that we usually use, use, you'll see a copy of this material in a format that you can print. So that'll make it a little easier for you. Types of poisons. Lacinators, which are eye irritants. It's tear gas. They usually use a lot of tear gas. French use tear gas. Uh, this sneeze gas, vomit gas. Then you have lung irritants, which are suffocants and respiratory irritants. And then you have vesicants or skin irritants. So let's look at the ones that suffocate you. Chlorine. Now chlorine is created by Fritz Haber. Now Fritz Haber's wife divorced him over doing this, but he said he did it for the fatherland. Later on, it will be completely forgotten, and he will win the Nobel Prize in chemistry for basically creating chemical fertilizer in the 1920s. Then you have phosgene, which will come along after chlorine, and then you have carbon oxychloride, chloromethachlorine formate, braxitone, and serprinin. What these do pretty much kill you on the spot. Some a little slower than others, but usually pretty much on the spot. Then you have the ones that irritate your skin and throat. The most famous of these is the mustard gas, dichlorolephthamine sulfide. Then you have the chlorosins and again bromosins. So those are the different types of gases that everybody messed with. The British used them, French used them, but the Germans used them more frequently. And they used them more frequently against the Russians because the Russians have a much larger army. So it's one way of kind of thinning out the opponents. And this is not uncommon. In the war between Iran and Iraq, Iraq used chemical warfare. 
there because Iran had a much larger army. In addition, because the Iranians were Shiite, they had full beards. Gas masks can't seal properly. So mustard gas, nerve gas, those agents, the mask won't do you any good because there are gaps in it. That's why they used it. Okay, let's look at the big four that are used in World War One. Now you see the tear gas, which we know exactly what that, that does. We still use it all the time for crowd control. But let's look at the three really nasty ones. Chlorine, yellow gas, yellow green gas with a strong bleach-like odor. Soldiers describe that smell as a distinct mix of pepper and pineapple. Chlorine reacts with water in the lungs, forming hydrochloric acid and causes coughing, vomiting, irritation of the eyes and low concentration, and rapid death at concentrations of a thousand parts per million. First used 1915 by German forces at Ypres and first used by the British forces for the first time in September 1915 at Luz. Estimated casualties, and it's it's hard to tell. To have a gas casualty, you almost need to die on the battlefield from, from this. These gas products will frequently cause death later, which would just be considered wounded and then died of wounds. Now, 5,000 is what they've estimated, but initially, as I said before, the, there was any, the Allies didn't have gas masks when this was first used. Then they went to phosgene, not that they weren't still using chlorine. Phosgene, colorless gas with a musty odor comparable to that of new mown hay or grass. If the odor is detectable at all, it indicates a hazardous level of phosgene. Its density is four times that of air. So these are heavy. The gases are heavy because you want them to go down. So uh, and you're in a trench area, you push it over the trench, it goes down into the lower areas. And when you fire heavy artillery afterwards, the reaction of heavy artillery is you dive to the bottom of your trenches where the poison gas collect. Now this reacts with proteins in your lung and causes suffocation, causes coughing, difficulty of breathing, irritation of the eyes and throat, can cause delayed effects, not evident for 48 hours, including fluid in the lungs and then death. First used in December of 1915, uh, the German forces used phosgene against the British at Ypres. So they started with chlorine and then tried the phosgene out before the Second Battle of Ypres was over. Estimated that 85% of all gas-related fatalities in World War I resulted from phosgene was often used in combination with chlorine. Then you have mustard gas. When pure mustard gas is colorless and odorless, it's a liquid, but it's used as a chemical agent in impure form. These are yellow-brown in color and have an odor resembling garlic or horseradish. Powerful irritant and blistering agent can damage the eyes, skin, respiratory tract, causes chemical burns on contact with the skin, forms intermediates that react with DNA, leading to cell death. First used in 1970, on July the 12th, German forces used mustard gas against the British at another battle at Ypres. Estimated casualties, the mortality rate of mustard gas is usually low, but its effects, effects are debilitating and patients require elaborate care. And you get you go blind. Also, I would tell you, if you want to see what mustard gas does, go to your, your browser and type on mustard gas injuries. Rather than, I did not want to put it up because they're too horrible to, to put in a presentation presentation like this where anybody might see that. But if you want to look at it on your own, it just literally bubbles up your skin and does all sorts of terrible things. So these are the, the big four. Everybody is usually, and mustard gas is still commonly used today, although we're using, the big countries are using other things such as sarin and, and nerve agents. These are some of the shells. Now you see there's, there's blue, there's yellow, and there's green, and each one of them represent the different type of gas that would be inside of them. And then you would have the canister in here. You, some of these can be fired from artillery pieces, but they can't be really big guns because the firing of that much power will cause it to explode in the gun. So you want a smaller size artillery, like a 75 millimeter, to fire these, but most of the time they're fired by a, a, a mortar shell. Now the problem with these is, I'll show you when I finish the poison gas section of this presentation, not all of these explode. Sometimes they end up stuck into the ground and then they have to be, well, sometimes they're found by farmers, and sometimes they're found by other people doing construction and then they have to be dealt with. Here's the risks from chlorine gas. Blurred vision, burning sensation in the eyes and throats, coughing, difficulty breathing, vomiting, irritation of the skin, pulmonary edema. As I said, yellow-green, smells like bleach. And then you have the phosgene. Both sides eventually shifted from chlorine to a combination, chlorine gas and phosgene. The new combination did not have the initial lethality of chlorine gas, but caused extreme coughing and choking. The effects of phosgene gas
gas poisoning had delayed effect and was known to kill soldiers 48 hours later. It's also known that soldiers were pretty good at understanding how badly their buddy had come down with this because in some cases you'll spit up, start spitting up pieces of your lungs. Frequently they would shoot them rather than choke to death. And then here we have a, a breakdown of all these different areas that you're affected. Now in the war, they'll eventually use gas masks, but you're not going to have gloves. You're just going to have your regular wool uniform and the helmet. So all the exposed skin, particularly in mustard gas, is really like hands and arms. They also found that when you use mustard gas, like in the late fall, in the winter, that would freeze into the ground. And in the spring, when they had the spring thaw, that water mixed with what was left of the mustard gas would burn people's arms. It also becomes very, very infected. And we don't, we only have sulfa drugs at this time. So antibiotics from 1944. Uh, then you have, and of course you see, it's a, it's a lung, eyes, and uh, skin irritant. And then the chlorine, which is a lung and an eyes weapon, turns water into hydrochloric acid in your lungs. And then the phosgene and diosphosgene which is everything but skin irritants. So now let's see the equipment used in World War I to protect the soldiers from poison gas. Since the Germans used poison gas first, one would assume that they would have the best gas mask. They would be testing them. And here we have a German soldier with his standard gas mask. I mean, it is really compact, easy to carry, and it's very, very durable. And here's one of the survivors. You have a leather exterior, you have the eye coverings with glass, and then you have the interchangeable uh, filters on the end of it. So they fit snugly. They're easy to upgrade when you need a new filter. It's as good as it gets for World War I. Here we have the early answer of the Allies for gas masks. They don't look like very much of a mask. We have goggles. Now that's good. That'll protect your eyes. What you have over their face is a wound bandage. Well, if you take a wound bandage, you strap it around your mouth. Okay, we're, we're doing okay. Well, that's not going to work either. Cotton wound wound bandage is not going to stop the gas. It might help a little bit. What you need to have them, the coverings over their mouths need to be soaked in urine because the urine will change the pH in the gas and neutralize it. So when you see pictures like that, they're not just wound bandages. They're usually soaked in urine. Fortunately for the Allies, they were very quick in developing gas masks. Before we go to the actual masks used by the Allied forces, let's see how we fire poison gas. Here is a set of German gas projectors. Basically, they look like mortars. Now, you can't fire these from long distances, so eventually the Allies get pretty good at determining when a gas attack is going to take place because they have to move these in the, in the position relatively close compared to regular artillery. Then here is an Allied project, and they can fire a round ball of an explosive with gas, or you can fire a shell like you would in a mortar. And here we have some of the projectors firing. You can see that as they come out, they're already producing the gas. Then here's an aerial view of another one of the advances, where you see the gas being fired and then moving along the ground. And as I said before, it's heavier than air, so it will go down into all sorts of crevices. And then here we have in this slide a picture showing the Germans having all of the wires to all the different projectors put together so they can all be fired simultaneously or in sequence. And then here's a little closer view, and you can actually see infantry troops behind the gas as it's blowing forward. And of course, they have their gas masks on. But this does take quite a bit of training because it's it's kind of scary no matter what you're doing. Now, if you're in the trenches, this is the device that was used by the Allies to warn you of a gas attack. It's a wooden claxton or clicker, and you spin that thing around, and it makes a god-awful noise. You, It's a gas attack. It gets your attention. Here are some real working gas masks for the Allies. Here's the French, some of the early French ones, the bag covering, which is somewhat effective, but it doesn't really have a filter on it. And then we have a little better variation of the mask that we saw initially, where you had to have it soaked in urine. But ultimately, we come up with the British box mask, which is used by everyone. The Americans use it, the uh, British obviously use it. You can carry it, your your mask fits into the, the little pocket area, you've got your filter in there. The filter filter on it lasts between two to four hours. You actually have a, a card to keep track of how often you use it. And by using it, it means th the amount of time you're breathing through it. And then it has that has to be replaced. And you'll find these periodically still till the day in antique stores. And I'll talk about those on, at another time. Then we have masks for the animals as well as for the troops. And then here is a chart showing the various types of masks. I always feel sorry for the Russians. The Russian mask looks really, really horrible. Uh, 
there's the UK USA lower left hand corner with the yellow canister. You also got a little package of uh, repair strips. So in case you got a hole in your hose, you could repair it very quickly. So those are all of the allies. But then you also see the Germans down there, and you see the Germans quite frankly just have a better a better gas mask. And, and most gas masks after World War One are going to look like that, even into the 50s and the 60s. And then here we have a picture of what you usually see at the end of a gas attack, where the people are lined up. They've got bandages over their eyes because their eyes have been damaged. So these are people waiting to be seen for treatment. Now we come to the German god of gas, Lieutenant Colonel George Brookmiller. Brookmiller created what is known as the De Brookmiller mix, which is a mix of gas and high explosives that were used during the great German offensive. And he nearly wins the war for Germany. So let's look at what he does. So as you're preparing to attack an area of allied trenches, first of all, he will fire yellow gas cross shells, which is mustard gas, and he'll fire that on the flanks because mustard gas disperses slowly. Second, they'll fire green cross shells. That's phosgene gas. Those are fired in the forward parts of the trenches and in the rear parts of the enemy trenches, and they're odorless and colorless. Then he does the big mix because what happens is the Allies are used to being gassed by 1918. So here come the gas shells, the Claxton blares, everybody puts their masks on and they're ready. Then he fires a blue cross shell. Now that has diphenylchloramine, and that is fired over the entire area. The blankets, the entire trench area. This is a chemical that clogs the filters on the Allied gas masks. Now you can imagine what that does to the troops. They're, they can't breathe properly. They're concerned about the gas, but they know the gas is now down in the bottom of the trench. So they start taking their masks off, and then they fire heavy artillery shells. Now the heavy artillery comes in, and the first thing that you do is you dive into the bottom of your trench where the poison gas is, where your filter doesn't work. And on top of this, the Germans have created, by the time they get to 1918, a group called Stormtroopers. This is 100,000 specially trained soldiers. And once the heavy artillery starts firing, they start out of the trenches and start moving forward because their opponents are down in the trenches. They're dealing with their clogged gas mask. And by the time everything clears and the artillery stops, they're within about five to 10 minutes, at least, if not closer, to being at the edge of the trenches. And I mean, the British and the French just abandoned these trenches in the early stages of the, of the Great Offensive gas casualties. Well, frequently they say, well, it's an insignificant amount. There are only 91,198 people killed in a gas attack. Look at the breakdown of this. There are a total of 1,296,853 people who were injured and killed in gas attacks. And if you consider that their lungs are damaged, most of these men aren't going to survive the great influenza in 1918 because that's going to go into their damaged lungs and finish them off. In addition, these are numbers, obviously, that the battlefield casualties. If you died back in the hospital, it didn't fall into this category. Look at the Russians. They had 56,000 deaths because most of them did not have gas masks in many cases. The Germans lost 9,000. That's because the British had used gas and, and the French had used gas against them as well. So you have a lot of casualties here. Sorry about that. I just got back from the grocery store. I wanted to talk a little bit about safety and gas masks. Now, I'll get, eventually get to the World War I one, which is right here in front of me. But today, they're referred to as NBC, Nuclear, Biological, and Chemical. This was the Soviet Union's mask in the 50s and the 60s. And even into the 80s, there were some countries, such as Iran, used this in the war against Iraq. It seals perfectly around your face, as long as you don't have a beard. And the canister screws on right here. And the canister is the interesting situation, in that they have a shelf life of between 8 to 10 years. Whether you use them or not, when the shelf life is over, you have to throw them away because the chemicals in here, which are good for all of these different problems, will go bad and could be hazardous to you. So today when you see masks such as this, same, 
fits in front, you screw it off, you screw it on. You have another one. Same way. This one has the possibility of having two, one on each side. This is similar to what they had in the Gulf War in the 1990s. In World War I, it's not what they had. This is what you had in World War I. Now remember that when you were looking through the film, the Germans had a mask that used a filter in the front that you could unscrew and then put it away. The Allies did not. And the one thing that you can't do, that you should never do, this is the canister that had a two hour to four hour maximum use. So you put it on here, you put your hose over the top, put a rubber band to hold it in place, and then you had a chart which you kept track of how often you used it. After you've used it for two to four hours, you had to remove it and put a new one on because the chemicals that it was filtering from the bottom here would have made this hazardous. So when you see a World War I mask like this with the original container on it, don't you ever put this thing on. There's no telling what this has become. In addition, the Allied masks were coated on the inside with a carbon black. Now, I've been taking this to school and using it in class for 20 years. And I still get carbon black soot on my desk when I just show it like this. To put this on and take a breath and you have asthma might be the last thing you do. So you never, ever put on a World War I mask that has this with it, or for that matter, even without it because of the interior of this. And you should never put a mask on, even if you were to find one of these with this in place, unless you put it there. You should take it off, just for safety purposes. It's not something to be played with. There's even a problem with this, because the original ones were made with asbestos. They all now come with a marker number on them, and you can actually go online and check and see when it was manufactured make sure it didn't have that. So these are just some things that even today we have to play with. But I've seen at least 15 or 20 of these in my, in my days of going to antique stores and garage sales. Just exactly like that. This is where I bought this one. Paid $10 for it. They let you keep it at the end of the war. And any number of people have probably played with it. The best part is the bag you carry it in. It makes a nice... Uh, little case because it has a spot for the all of the equipment so don't put this on and don't breathe with it okay thank you very much let's get back to world war one there are a lot of opportunities when i teach world war one to talk about the deminers and this is probably as good of a spot as any the deminers are a group of soldiers whose job it is is whenever somebody is doing construction and they find bombs or they're farming and they find bombs or you have people who go out in an old barn and find a case of grenades you know, this happens in belgium in france and that whole area where you have the world war one and world war ii bombings as well but in france they're called deminers and in every Every year you have anywhere from 17 to 35 French farmers injured as a result of hitting old ordnance. And usually every year or two or three, one of the miners is killed. Now in this picture you see a whole series of heavy explosives from World War I that were found and had to be removed. And the most dangerous of all of the devices that have to be removed are gas shells. Now when I showed pictures, they were painted, but that's gone. Notice in this picture everything is just rusted so there isn't any paint on them so you have to be careful because the shell of a, of a gas device is very very thin because it has to be able to break before it hits the ground if a gas shell goes into the ground and explodes then the gas will just remain in the hole it needs to come out above the ground so they have a, a thinner shell that barometric pressure will pop it so normally if it's a gas shell you're supposed to have a full chemical biological warfare suit on gas mask then you go in and you pick it up and sometimes forget and think it's a high explosive shell they don't put the device on all their equipment and somebody gets gassed so it is a very very dangerous job 
The Sinking of the Lusitania, May the 7th, 1915. This turns out to be a propaganda nightmare for the Germans. It also is a problem for Woodrow Wilson. Here's the location on the map where the Lusitania was sunk. Usually when we fly to Europe we, and we end up flying into London, our plane has that marked on the map as you fly over so you can tell where it is. Here's a, it's a postcard from the Cunard line showing the Lusitania. It's a fast ship. It's actually faster than any torpedo that that was fired during the war. The problem is that the British are using passenger ships to carry munitions. They claimed that wasn't true, but there are tons and tons of ammunition all across the sea floor where the Lusitania went down, and we now know that it indeed was carrying them. Here's a picture of her in port getting ready to sail away, and there's the notice that the Germans put in the newspapers warning people that this is a British flagged ship, it is not a neutral ship, and that they are subject to being sunk going into a war zone. And here we have a beginning to leave the dock, and this is the last picture taken of the Lusitania leaving New York before she was sunk. Now, if you were sailing on the Lusitania, you had, obviously, different choices of accommodations. Here's first class, very nice. Second class, it's not too bad. Third class, goes down a little bit. Actually, in third class, they're afraid that you might actually steal the blanket cover, and so they kind of sewed it to the mattress, so you kind of slide into it like getting into a hot dog. And then here we have some Lusitania wear. Some of their, I believe it's Wedgwood, was for the dining service. Now you have to be kind of careful here. I mean, you're not supposed to, first of all, no one is supposed to be going down to the site and plucking stuff up. That's illegal. Sometimes people will say that this is material from the Lusitania. And some has been recovered on archaeological expeditions. But you have to remember that there were boxes or cases of this stuff in warehouses that would have been used for bread breakage over the years. Some of that has been destroyed, but some of it is still hung around. So sometimes people may be selling you an, quote, authentic item from the Lusitania, but it was never on the ship. So there's a little bit of the background of the Lusitania, one of the biggest ocean liners in the world at the time. Here are our two captains. There's Captain Turner of the Lusitania, a very well-respected captain. And there's Captain Swigert, who was the commander of the U-20, which is the submarine that sank the Lusitania. Lusitania. There's the picture of the U-20. You notice it has a deck gun. Actually, it has two deck guns. It's because you could carry more artillery shells than you could carry torpedoes. So normally, in, in the days before unrestricted submarine warfare, the rules of engagement were if it was an unarmed ship, you would come to the surface, give them a chance to get into their lifeboats, and then sink it with artillery shells. When it became impossible for a submarine to determine whether that what looked like a transport ship wasn't armed, then they began sinking everything without warning. So that's why you see deck guns on it. Now here's the route of both the Lusitania and the U-20. And you see the U-20 is cruising through the Irish Sea and it makes a little circle and then gets in the position. We recognized it for the periscope because it's a four-stack ship. Swigert knew that her ship couldn't catch up with it, nor could his torpedoes catch up with it. It would simply take a little luck. So here's the last picture taken of the Lusitania. I believe it was from a fishing boat. Now, the Lusitania had been warned that there were submarines in the area and she needed to take evasive measures, which meant she should be zigzagging. As you can see from this chart, she wasn't doing very much zigging at all. So basically, the U-20 stayed in a position and just hoped that the Lusitania would sail across in front of her, which is exactly what she did. And so Swigert fired his last torpedo. This slide shows two things. One is what she would normally have seen in the newspaper where you'd have the advertisement for the Cunard line of the sailing of the Lusitania and you see how the Germans put their emergency notice, their warning notice directly underneath it. The other part shows where the torpedo fired by the U-20 hit the Lusitania and then of course it then goes down. You see there were 1,958 passengers, 1,198 drowned, 128 of them United States citizens. The ship was carrying 173 tons of rifle ammunition and artillery shells. And of course, the ship's almost 800 feet long, sinks in 300 feet of water, went down in 18 minutes. Is one of the reasons why you had such a loss of life. And then that the German U-20 in its lifetime sank 37 ships, grounded on November the 14th, 1916, and on the Danish coast, and was then destroyed by its crew.
Here's the New York Times headlines. Lusitania sunk by a submarine. Estimated casualties, 1,260. Torpedoed twice. The second explosion that people heard was probably ammunition on the ship. And again, rehash of the casualties, 128. Some people say it's 124. And there's one of the political cartoons of the era showing the sinking of the Lusitania. And then here we have the stamp that was created to remember the sinking. Talks about the hit with one torpedo. People claim that was the second one, but Schweiger said that he would not have fired another torpedo through innocent people in the water. And we're pretty sure he was down to his last torpedo anyway. And then some interesting pictures. Now, some of the people were buried in mass graves, which you see here. And then we have this gentleman who claimed that he'd been a really lucky person. This gentleman claimed that he was a member of the Titanic at one time, that he that he was on the Lusitania and that he had managed to uh, get off the ship, the Empress of Ireland. Uh, Mr. Turner, as he was known, there's no such person who served on any of those ships. It's always been kind of an urban legend that people survived the ship. And then here, people staging a picture. Oh, look, we've got, we've got drowned people, although they're pretty dry for drowned people. But the truth of the story is in the ship. The little life, look at the size of the spelling on the ship. And it's not exactly even. These are the actual surviving dinghies from the Lusitania. Much smaller, completely different look. But probably the oddest thing to occur is five years after the Lusitania sank, this life jacket was fished from the Delaware River in Philadelphia. It must have been carried by the south by the current to Africa, going west and then bobbing its way up the east coast of the United States, making a journey of many thousands of miles. It is in the uh, Maryland Maritime Museum in Philadelphia, if you wish to go and see that. Now, Woodrow Wilson is really on the spot with the sinking of the Lusitania. The United States is neutral. There is a large get-involved-in-the-war group led by Teddy Roosevelt and others. But the sinking of the Lusitania forces him to do something. And he had a two-page letter sent to the German high command and the Kaiser. It satisfied no one. It actually made things a little bit worse. On the one hand, the Secretary of State under Woodrow Wilson is William Jennings Bryan. And you'll see that it is signed Brian at the bottom of the page. Well, Brian believed that this letter was so aggressive that it would lead to the United States being involved in the war, and he disagreed and he resigned. But everybody else read it as something completely different. And it's basically, if you go to the third paragraph from the bottom, the government of the United States, therefore, desires to call the attention of the imperial German government with the utmost earnest to the fact that the obligation to their present method of attack against the trade of their enemies lies in the practical impossibility possibility of employing submarines in the destruction of commerce without disregarding those rules of fairness, reason, justice, and humanity which all modern opinion regards as imperative. The government and the people of the United States look to the imperial German government for just, prompt, and enlightened action in this vital matter with the greater confidence because the United States and Germany are bound together not only by special ties of friendship but also by the explicit stipulation of the treaty expressions of regret and offers of reparation in a case of the destruction of neutral ships sunk by mistake, while they may satisfy international obligations if no li loss of life results, cannot justify or excuse a practical and the na natural and necessary effect of which is subject neutral nations and neutral persons to new and impossible risks. Well, he also gives two examples of neutral ships that had been sunk prior to the Lusitania, although Lusitania is not a neutral ship, and that there was loss of life. But the cartoons, the political tar cartoons, are absolutely savage. This is the cover of Life magazine from the time period, and it shows Kaiser Wilhelm walking with his boots covered in blood, leaving bloody footprints, and throwing Wilson a few coins with a bald eagle, the American emblem, sitting in the back with its head down. Now, I've looked for it. I couldn't find it online. There is a political cartoon in front of the White House. It shows the White House with a park bench in front of it with a spinal column on it. And the caption is, Missing from the White House. Look at the title of the magazine. It says, Humiliation Number. So, Wilson 
Poland is, is in a pickle here, but the Germans are in an even bigger one. The Lusitania sinking changes American public opinion drastically. They're now anti-German. The pro-German groups and even German businessmen have to begin, in some cases, changing names. Rocks start getting thrown through their windows. Support for, for, the, for the German causes almost completely evaporates at this point, and it will continue to get worse. From the German high command, they're not very, they don't respect the United States at all. They don't respect Wilson at all, see him as a weak individual, and see us as a weak country. Not our Navy, but everything else, and they are correct. We have no, we have a very poor army, mostly National Guards for all practical purposes. We have an Air Force of about 25 airplanes, affectionately called flying coffins, and I'll talk about them again later on, just before we get into the war. And there, for a while, we'll go back to the old system, which was warning what appear to be unarmed ships. That was the, the rules of engagement of submarine warfare prior to World War One. was if it's a neutral ship, the submarine is supposed to come up, warn it, give the people a chance to get off the ship before they sink it. You don't have to do that with a warship. So when you use unrestricted submarine warfare, that means you don't warn anybody, you sink everything without warning. That's what we do not want. And they will go back to warning ship to keep us out for a while. One thing I want to get across, I have this happen over and over and over again. The Lusitania is not the reason why the United States entered World War One. If that were true, we wouldn't have declared war in April of 1917, because this event happened in 1915. But it is the most common thing that I had when I taught high school, that students would come in and they just, somebody had been beating them to death with, this is the event that brought us into the war. It is not. It is the event that changed American public opinion against Germany, okay? Now we'll see what the rest of the world does with the Lusitania. Other reaction to the sinking of the Lusitania include a massive recruitment routine. Here you have the take up the sword of justice, join the military and get even for those people killed on the Lusitania. Irishmen avenge the Lusitania, join the Irish regiment today. Then you come to the poster of posters. It just says enlist and it has this woman drowning in the water with an infant in her arms. It is the most valuable poster of World War One. If it were an artist's drawing of the representative Presentation of someone drowning with a child in the water, it would be powerful. But there's actually photographed, they photographed all the bodies, and there is a woman in this position holding an infant in rigor mortis, painted at the, that the artist used as his basis. Now, the World War One Museum here in Kansas City has a smaller version that they have in their display on the Naval War, but I know they have a full-size version of this because I have a picture of it when it was in the old museum. Now, the British used this to great propaganda advantage. They manufactured a medal, which they claimed was given to the crew of the U-20 for doing their duty. No such medal was ever handed out to the U-20. Now, Schweigert was given a military honor, but the crew did not get this particular medal. The British claimed that they found out, got a copy of it, and they sold it. It cost $30, and that's a lot of money. Uh, when my dad served in World War I, he was a corporal. I believe he made $19 a month, so $30 would have been an almost two month salary. But they sold a million of these. The money was supposed to go to orphans and other people on the Lusitania. Whether that did or didn't remains to be seen. One side of it, which shows the people lining up to buy their ticket from the death's head skeleton. And then the other side of it shows the ship going down. It's still relatively common to find. At prices of, of everything in World War One have gone up pretty significantly since we're in the, well, well, just finishing up the centennial. And then the there's the postcard. This is actually a German postcard showing the torpedo hitting the Lusitania, and you have the overall commander of the German Navy, which is Trippitz, Great Beard. And then up above it, you have a little cartoon called Chums. You got Kaiser Wilhelm and the Devil. When I really began to admire you, my friend, was when you pulled that Lusitania job. When you did that, I said to myself, there's a man after my own heart. So you have all kinds of stuff like that. And then this is an interesting item. It's a hate card. You would carry this in your wallet to remind you of the in, inhuman crime of the sinking of the Lusitania. And so it has the background of it on one side in sacred memory and then continues on the other side. So those are some of the things that were the propaganda, anti-German propaganda that churned up as a result of the sinking of the Lusitania.
Here's a photograph of the Lusitania today at the bottom of the Irish Sea. Periodically, the site is checked to make sure it's intact and left alone. And they usually keep an eye on up above. They don't want people coming down here and trying to loot it. It is a protected site. Well, after fighting all of 1915, what were the results? So here is the map of Europe at the beginning of 1915. See the Western Front, see the Russian Front, and then in the end of 1915 and the 1916, you see that there's really very little movement on the western front, but there's a lot of movement on the on the eastern front. A significant amount of land taken from the Russians. Even the Austrians are taking land away from the Russians. But in the western front, stalemate. 